Good morning. Good morning. Welcome in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. What a beautiful day we have. And something on that for just a moment. We have a season of rain, and then all of a sudden there's a day like today, and we realize how blessed we are. But it also goes in reverse. In the summertime, we might have a season of days like this for two months long, 
And then we'll have a rainstorm, and we'll praise God. God has a wonderful way of reminding us of how much we need Him. And there are things that we might not always appreciate, but in God's hands, they are a blessing. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we ask that as we worship you this morning, you would remind us that you are the sovereign God. And that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to your purpose. Oh Lord, may this service be one that is in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' precious name, amen. amen. Would you please turn in your hymnals to our opening song this morning, hymn number 138. Please stand together as we sing Holy Ground. tell you, there are times 
that you and I can sometimes feel alone in our faith. We are not. Amen. There are times that you and I might feel that, you know, this world is, is in great trouble, and it is. Yes, yes, yes. But there is also great hope. Hallelujah. Because the Spirit of God is active in brothers and sisters in Christ all over the place. The question is, do we and do our brothers and sisters come together and act like the body of Christ? Mm -hmm. And so there's a quick encouragement. With that introduction, I'm going to ask Miss Teresa to come forward. She has an announcement about tonight, a special activity. I'd like you to come forward, though. <laughs> and uh, also something that will be happening in September. Well, Jim said, yes. We are seeing an incredible move of God as we watch evil seem to look like it's getting ahead. God is victorious. Amen. And we're going to take that victory lap with him. Yes, Lord. Tonight at 4 o'clock, 4 to 6, we're going to have a cloth meeting. Cloth means Christian leaders of the Hudson, for some of you who may or may not know that. And from that outreach in Orange County, in Orange County, now we're getting a larger outreach with churches. Together, we are not a bunch of broken pieces. I won't say amputated. Oops, I just did. We're not a bunch of amputated body parts. We, his church, is one church. And the faster that we get together with that, the faster we'll see things change. We'll see people come. We'll see hearts restored. We'll see, we'll see, we'll see incredible things. But it might not be easy. Tonight at four o'clock, cloth. And tonight's kickoff is for a revival happening in Montgomery in September, September 23rd. Now, I've always struggled with putting up a tent and calling it a revival. We're not doing that. A revival starts in the hearts of man and the heart of woman. Revival starts with a contrite spirit, a remorseful spirit. Some of us have done things that we need to come to God with, and some of us have not done things that we should have done mm -hmm. that we need to confess as well. Mm -hmm. So from that heart is where revival starts. So get ready. Just stay seated. Psalm 51. If you know it, sing it with me. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. together and then 
blessing us with some music. Today after church, there is the, uh, the deacons meeting, so a quick reminder for that. And um, our next DBS meeting is going to be in two weeks, the week after Mother's Day. So uh, those are the announcements that I have this morning. Um, and in the bulletin, there is a reminder that we have a session meeting. We've gone a number of months now having session meetings, and nobody has sent us a, a note or a concern or an encouragement. Um, and we just want to remind the congregation that the elders want to be able to bring to that table the current encouragements and concerns of the congregation. Does anyone else have an announcement that I may have forgotten? Yes, Sharon. We are six months out now from Operation Christmas Child and shoeboxes. So just making that kind of first announcement of the year, please keep that in mind and in your prayers as we go throughout this next six months and leave up to that uh, collection week. Um, you know, we can start collecting at any time. We can start collecting every month through the year and collect everything each month for uh, things that happen in boxes. It's not just about a one and done type of thing. Um, um, just really, you know, pray about that and consider what you can do um, for those two boxes. Um, and I'm going to piggyback on that real fast. I know that Renee specifically has the gift of writing cards. Mm -hmm. I'm going to encourage as a congregation this year that we not just fill shoe boxes, but that you write a personal note. Amen. That you write a note to the child that's going to receive that. And if you feel comfortable to put your address on it, wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if a child from someplace else in the world sent you a note and said thank you? and you've started to become prayer warriors together. Wouldn't that be an awesome connection? So, Operation Christmas Child. Anyone else? Oh. Oh my God. 
Nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing. Nothing is too difficult for me. Okay, Carol, before we sing it again, there was a spot where there's a clap. Now, if you are glued to your hymn book, because we don't have the video today, that's okay. You have feet. You have a mouth. So we sing with our mouths. There are times that we can clap with our hands, but you can also do one of these. All right? So there's just one spot. Carol, we're going to sing it through two more times. And I love the power part because I get to give him a little punch. Our Lord God, thou hast made the heavens and the earth by thy great power. Our Lord God, thou hast made the heavens and the earth with an outstretched arm. And nothing is too difficult for thee. Nothing is too difficult for thee. Great and mighty God.
give you glory Hallelujah. and honor and praise, yes, adoration and exaltation. You are worthy. Hallelujah. Lord, we are not. Our mouths, our lives, we can barely move mm -hmm. without your spirit. Our praises are our noise without your spirit. But oh, when you fill us, Lord, Thank you, Lord. how our voices can be lifted to heaven, how our hearts can be lifted high, mm -hmm. and how you see us as your children Amen. washed in the blood of the Lamb. Father, may we worship you in spirit and in truth. Amen. 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 Please be seated. At this time, I'd like to ask the children to come forward for Children's Church. And we'll meet right here so we can pray for you on your way. Since Resurrection Sunday, we've been working through a series. It's in a season of the year that we call Easter Tide. It's immediately following Resurrection Sunday. The world calls that Easter. And it's right before Pentecost, the time when we remember that the Holy Spirit came upon His church. And during this season, we're remembering Jesus' ministry after the resurrection. I want you to think for just a moment before we go to scripture about that. Here is the almighty God. Here is Jesus, Emmanuel, wrapped in flesh, came to die that we might live. And so the cross on Good Friday. Here is the empty tomb. Death has been conquered. Satan has been put in his place. He's lost, by the way. Satan lost. At that moment, Jesus could have gone to heaven. I like on Resurrection Sunday to talk about that tomb and the stone and remind everybody the stone was not rolled away so Jesus could get out. We know from the rest of Scripture that his new and glorified body, he was able to walk through walls. I don't understand it. I just know he's God. The stone was rolled away for us. So that we could look into the tomb and know that he was alive. Well, why did he stay on earth for this ministry, this public ministry, after the resurrection? He did his job. He died for you. He died for me. He took our sins upon himself. He loves us so much that after the resurrection, he stayed around. To confirm the truth. To affirm the truth. To help you and to help me have a faith that is not grounded in just mere words and stories. But in facts. In signs and wonders. The title of this morning's message is His Story is History. And History is is his story. This is not a belief, a, a religion that is founded simply in a philosophical idea. Most faiths have a founder, absolutely. And you can trace Confucianism to Confucius. You can trace Buddhism to Buddha. But the reality is that those faiths are built on, a, on just philosophies, not facts. The fact of the reality that Jesus Christ was a real God-man 
is overwhelming. It is history. Buddha existed. I have no doubt about that. Confucius existed. I have no doubt about that. But the truth of their philosophies leads to a dead end. And that I am sure of. The reality is that we as Christians believe that Jesus is God, not just man. Buddha was just a man. Maybe he was a good man, as you and I would see good and bad people. The reality is, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so the man who stands before you, I am not good. Without the saving work of Jesus Christ, my righteousness is as filthy rags. Mm -hmm. Without what Jesus did for me and for you, we stand before God as condemned and sinful. Buddha was not a good man in God's eyes. You and I are not good in God's eyes in and of ourselves. Confucius is not a good man in God's eyes. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so all these different faiths founded on human beings are founded on sinful, fallen philosophies. It is only Christ. It is only Christ that can save you. There is no other name by which man must be saved. I encourage you to grab your Bibles and look in 1 Corinthians. <coughs> and if you've been with us for the last few weeks, you'll notice that I am notoriously grabbing the wrong Bible from the wrong place in church, so I'm not even going to tell you the page number. I'll have one of you. What is it there, Joe? 1,222. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 11. 1,222. And we're going to pray that God sends His Holy Spirit in a fresh way. Father in Heaven, we ask as we read Your Word, that you pour out an overabundance of your Holy Spirit right now. Mm -hmm. Lord, we don't need to ask for your presence because you've not left us. Thank you, Lord. We are the temples of your Spirit. But Lord, we ask that you would pour out an outpouring in such a way that your word comes alive to us this morning. Mm -hmm. And that we are challenged and convicted and encouraged. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The writer of 1 Corinthians is the Apostle Paul. Paul was not one of the twelve. Paul was not an individual who sat at the feet of Jesus and listened to Jesus teach and to preach. Paul was not an individual who was a disciple of Christ and followed Christ and saw the miracles. Paul's a lot like you and I, in more ways than I think we care to admit. Paul became an apostle because God chose him, revealed himself to him in a supernatural, spiritual way. And Paul is writing to the church in Corinth. Now I have to tell you something about Corinth. Corinth is a fallen, horrible city. Sounds a lot like the culture we live in. And the church in Corinth is doing some things wonderful, and they're doing some things not so wonderful. The wonderful thing they're doing is they are holding on to the gospel. But their moral lives are spinning a little bit out of control. You can check me out on this at another point. Talk to me after the service. The church in Galatia was having a different problem. They were starting to fall away from the gospel. <laughs> they were starting to 
have a different idea of what the gospel said. And Paul writes to them to call them back. But Paul wants to encourage the church in Corinth. Hear these words. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, as of first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he raised, was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. Though it was not I, but it was the grace of God that is in me. Whether then it was I or they say, or I or they, so we preach and so you believe. Back to the top of the passage. Now I want to remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. Paul starts off with a compliment. I'm reminding you, I preached to you the gospel, and you received it. What does it mean to receive something? Receiving something is, I am taking it for my own. This morning, I was about three minutes late getting here for adult Sunday school and an individual was going to drop off some food who doesn't go to our church for the cloth meeting tonight. And there's a little pile of stuff right by the door. I wasn't here to receive it. I wasn't here to, to take ownership of it. I got it eventually. But I wasn't here at the time to, to receive it. I could have walked past it. You guys all know what receiving something in the mail is like. You know what it is to, to receive a package and have to sign for it. The church in Corinth heard the preaching of the gospel and they received it. But more than that, they were standing, they were dwelling in the, the truth of it. They were remaining in the gospel. They were standing in the truth of the gospel. We've made a distinction over the last few weeks that a lot of Christians like to have what I'm going to call cheap grace. Cheap grace is, and this is not meant to be offensive, and I'm going to bother some people. I love John 3.16, so please don't take me wrong. But cheap grace is when somebody flippantly says, God so loved the world and gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Just believe in Jesus. And you've heard me say, and scripture says, the devil even believes in Jesus. There's more in the meaning of that verse than a quick belief. I'm not even going to call it an empty belief because you bet your bottom dollar the devil truly believes in Jesus. It's not an empty belief. You know what I mean by that. An empty sorry is when someone goes, sorry, but they really don't believe that they're sorry and they don't mean it. An empty belief often is when we say we believe something, but we really don't. Oh, I believe you. Uh -huh. Wink, wink. No, that's an empty belief. The devil truly believes in Jesus, but he has not received Christ. Jesus is not his Lord and Savior. John 3.16 is a wonderful verse. 
It is a verse that, that introduces somebody absolutely the beginning of, of our salvation is believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. But that word believe, I wish we could translate it fully into English better. Believe and receive. Stand in the gospel. Stand in the truth. Remain in the truth. Don't just be like the devil and believe. But knowing Jesus, being intimate with Jesus. We used that example last week where in the Old Testament, whenever we use the words, no, Abraham knew Sarah. That was like their honeymoon night type thing. They were intimate with each other. They knew each other. The two became one. To be a believer in Jesus Christ is not just simply, oh yeah, I believe. Maybe you really do believe. But do you know, are you intimate with God? Are you intimate with Jesus Christ? Paul is telling this Corinthian church, good job, guys. You've received the gospel and you're standing in it. Now, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you receive, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believe in vain. Now, what is the foundation of the gospel of Christ? For I deliver to you first importance what I received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. That's the definition of a brother or sister in Christ. That's it. I'm excited that yes, the elders in this church have a deeper sense of theology than just that. But I am so excited that the elders in this church see that as the cornerstone. It is the gospel. Who Jesus is and what Jesus did. The other things, they're out here. They're not the foundation. At that National Day of Prayer, my heart broke. A sister in Jesus Christ came to the gathering, and I knew who she was. She's not part of our local fellowship. I've known her for a number of years, and I went up, and you know that I'm not a handshaker, I'm a hugger. And I said her name, and I gave her a hug, and she looked shocked at me. You're welcoming me? Now, I kind of think I'm normally pretty welcoming. Well, too much so sometimes. And I was like, yeah, why not? Well, I vote a Democrat and nobody likes me anymore. <laughs> I have to tell you, you could have knocked me over. Now, if you know anything about me and my politics, I am not a Democrat. So what? Is she washed in the blood of the Lamb? Yes, she is. Does she acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior? Yes, she is. Does she think that Jesus died for her sins? Yes, she does. She's my sister. Amen. And that she would think that I would not love her. Because she voted Democrat. Broke my heart. We're taking the gospel and adding to it. Now, please don't get me wrong. I struggle with the politics of this nation, both Democrat and Republican. I struggle with the direction of our politicians because by no means morally are they following the precepts and statutes of God's word. And the United States is on a dangerous track to find that it is going to be judged at the, the seat of the God Almighty who sits on the throne. And do I think that maybe one side's on the right direction? Poor English, I know, I'm doing it on purpose. Righter direction than the wronger direction? 
yeah, but that a sister in Christ would see a brother in Christ and be shocked that there's going to be fellowship. What have we turned the church into? What is it that's dividing us? I'm going to tell you what's dividing us. An evil spirit. What's dividing us is demonic forces that are telling us, well, what's really important is your political views. What's really important is your moral views. What's really important is what denominational view you have. They're important to fight about. Please don't get me wrong. I'm going to use an analogy like marriage. Scripturally, there is only one reason, one real, real reason, that a marriage should break up. And that is the unfaithfulness of a spouse. Mm -hmm. Not me saying it, that's the scripture, sorry. Now, however you want to define unfaithfulness, that's a whole other conversation, but the unfaithfulness of a spouse. That's the essentials. There's a lot of things that husbands and wives ought to fight about, should fight about. They're important, but it ought not be the thing that drives them apart. If there are two different views of how to raise children, they should fight. It's important. If there are two different views of how to use finances, they should fight about it. It's important. If they have two different views of how to spend their leisure time, how they spend time together, those are important things. Husbands and wives should wrestle with one another and come to one accord, yes. But they should wrestle with, it's important. But that should not be the kind of thing that drives them apart. They should be willing to wrestle, willing to fight over important things. But not separate all that. Now, I didn't talk about the socks left on the floor. I didn't talk about the direction of the toilet paper. I didn't talk about whose cooking is good or whose cooking is better. You know what? Sin has so infiltrated the church of Jesus Christ, the things that annoy us divide us more than the essentials of the faith. I want you to hear that again. Yeah. The things that annoy us, the socks on the floor, are creating divorces in the body of Christ instead of the essentials of the faith. How our Heavenly Father in Heaven must have a broken heart. I don't like the way that person sings. I don't like the music that's picked. I don't like the, the color that that was painted. I didn't have any say in that. Okay. Who cares? Well, we're human beings, let's be honest. We do care. It does bother us. It gets under our skin. But those are annoyances. Those are not the essentials of the faith. What is the essentials of the faith? Now I deliver to you a first importance what I received from Christ. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. If you have somebody who's washed in the blood of the Lamb, they are a brother and sister in Christ. They might annoy you to all get out, but you're part of the same family. And how it breaks God's heart that the church of Jesus Christ has gotten divorce after divorce after divorce. Again, I'm not talking about literal marriage now. I'm talking about how the two who were supposed to be one are now two again. For not the right reasons. I firmly believe there are other things in Scripture that are essential. Things like acknowledging that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are one God. 
I certainly believe there are other things that are essential, that scripture itself is the final authority, not the, the word of a human being, not an elder, not a pastor, not a, not a pope, not a bishop, not a vicar, not a priest, I don't care who you want to call yourself, that it's God's word that's the final authority, that scripture is the final authority, because it is God's word. I certainly think there are other things that are, are essential. But I love the fact that Paul is boiling it down. To what makes somebody a brother or sister in Christ? You've received it and you're standing in it. Corinthian church, boy, hang out there. But the title of our message is, His story is history. And history is his story. Well, what does Jesus do? What did Jesus do for Paul? What does Jesus do for you? And he appeared to Cephas, verse 5, just so those who don't know, Cephas, by the, by the way, is another name for Peter. If you're ever wondering who Cephas was that, that Paul is talking about, he's talking about the big fisherman. He's talking about the apostle Peter. He's talking about the one who Jesus said to him after his death and resurrection, Peter, do you love me? Excuse me, he said that before. His death and resurrection. Peter, do you love me? And who do you say I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, on this rock I will build my church. I know the Catholic Church takes that to say, well, Peter, that is the rock. No, it was the statement that was made that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. That's the rock that Jesus was talking about. Amen. Cephas. Jesus appeared to Cephas after the resurrection, to Peter, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. That's actually where I want to focus for the next few moments. Once in a while, I'll have a brother or sister in Christ tell me about a miracle that God has performed in their life. And I have a choice to make. Do I believe them or do I think they're nuts? Now, you've all been there. I am not the only weird one in this room. Somebody will come up to you and tell you about a miracle that has happened in their life. And I have a choice to make. Do I believe them or do I think they're a little kooky? And I've met some Christians who are kooky, believe me. And maybe you think I'm one of them, and that's okay. I don't really think that everybody who tells me a miracle took place in their life, that it really was a miracle. I think sometimes people are delusional. All people are honest. But I know my God's still at work. And I know my God still does do miracles. And I know my God has done things in history, and till, still today, that are signs and wonders. I've seen some things in my life. I've experienced things in my life that I can only attribute to God because the chances of them happening are so astronomically slim that it's harder to believe in the lottery than it is my God. Amen. Bottom line, that was something God did in my life. I'll tell you the story and you have a choice to make. Was it a real miracle for me, or am I just kooky, delusional? Here Paul is talking about 500 people who have seen the risen Jesus Christ alive from the tomb. And many of them are still alive. Now I'm going to tell you, it's pretty easy to say one guy is kooky. Pretty easy to say a couple people are a little kooky. It's awful hard to put down 500 eyewitnesses. It's awful hard. And Paul is challenging the church at Corinth. You doubt it? Go talk to them. Most of them are still living. Some have fallen asleep. Some have died. What a loving God we have. He knew that we would need something to ground our faith in. My friends, we do not serve a God who demands blind, mysterious faith. 
I want you to hear that again. We do not serve a God who demands blind, mysterious faith. He has confirmed and affirmed his presence in creation. He has confirmed and affirmed who he was in history. And the more and more that they dig in the dirt in archaeology in the Middle East, the more and more they find the truth that scripture is standing on the truth. Fact. I find it so crazy that the world wants to take Christianity and put it in this world of mental somersaults. Human beings love to make up stories. It's okay. There's nothing wrong with being creative. But this is not a story. This is his story. And it's his story. In preparing for today's message, for fun, I wanted to do something that very rarely do I I set the Bible aside for a little while. And I started to do some research about outside of the Bible, what kinds of references were there to Jesus? The historical Jesus. And over and over again, and in that first and second and third century, there were an abundance of writings. And you have to realize this is 2,000 years ago, and most things have, have rotted away. I've got a library in, in the other end of the church here where I do my studying, and some of the early books that I purchased for myself when I was in high school, because I already at that point was into the, the Bible and into learning how to preach and learning how to understand theology, the pages are turning yellow. Am I that old? And I bet you, you some of you have books like that too. Books that you bought when you were younger, and you open it up now, and you're like, are my eyes going bad, or is this getting yellow? Man, if we have just a couple of references to Jesus from 2,000 years ago in, in some literature that was written, that's miraculous in itself. It's hard for me to find some early editions of things that are only 100 years ago, much less 2,000 years ago. That God would preserve not only his holy, written, inspired, and errant word for us, but that God even preserved in history, in that first century, in that second century, in that third century, the truth of Jesus, the historical, real God made flesh. Now, I realize some of the writings were people who were Christians. But you know what? Some of the writings were for people who weren't Christians. And they acknowledged that there was this man named Jesus who was put to death on a Roman cross and that the tomb was empty and that this whole massive movement in the Jewish community took place and they became followers of the way called Christians. This is history, my friends. We have such a wonderful God. He will do whatever it takes to give you a faith that is grounded, not a blind, empty leap of faith, When I was a child, my dad loved, and I learned this, and so I did it with my kids once in a while. You've all done it. You put them up somewhere high and jump! As a child, I would have never jumped into the arms of a stranger. Now, that stranger might have been bigger and stronger than my dad. But I tell you right now, I don't know you. I don't trust you. I don't know if you need glasses. You might not catch me. But I knew my dad. I knew him. And I trusted him. Not because it was a blind leap of faith. I knew my dad loved me. I knew my dad would catch me. I knew my dad cared about me. And so when we were together and playing, and my dad said, go ahead, jump. I had no problem jumping. My friends, 
God loves you so much that even after he rolled the stone away to confirm to you and me that he was no longer dead but alive, he stuck around for 50 days. 40 days. Then there was the ascension and then 10 days later there was the Pentecost. He stuck around to confirm to all of history the truth of the resurrection. If you do not believe that Jesus is God, Then I'll love you as a fellow human being, but you're not my brother or sister in Christ. You might even believe all the same politics I do. But that young lady, who has a different political view than I do, is more my sister than the individual that doesn't believe that Jesus is God. If you don't believe that Jesus died on the cross, you know how crazy we as human beings are? There are people even in the church who call themselves Christians who will say Jesus did not really die. Mm. He merely swooned. He fainted. Mm. This is a real theory, by the way. You can go look it up. It's called the swoon theory. He fainted on the cross. And they thought he was dead. They laid him in the tomb. And the coolness of the tomb woke him up. I'm going to tell you, that person should play the lottery. Because they have got a better faith than I do in unrealistic worldviews. There are individuals who will say that, yes, he died, but he didn't rise from the dead. That the apostles, these fishermen, these common people took on the guards at the tomb. More than likely Roman guards, but they could also have been the temple guard soldiers. They took them on, they fought them off, they rolled the stone away, and they stole the body. But then it doesn't make any logical sense that these 12 apostles would make up the story of the resurrection and be willing to die for the lie. They didn't make any money on the story. They really didn't get fame for the story. And they were willing to die for it. The logic isn't there. My friends, we have a God of order, not disorder. We have a God of creation and design, not a God of things that are in chaos. God wants us to use our minds. God wants us to use our whole beings. In worship, we are to worship him in spirit and in truth, but with our whole being, our voices, our minds, our social gatherings. God creates us as whole beings. He does not want us to have a blind, empty, illogical faith. And so he gave us all those things to show us his story is history. To say that these common guys fought off the guards at the tomb and rolled the stone away and stole the body and were willing to die for a lie is, is ludicrous. But some people find that easier to believe than the truth. May your hearts break for people who want to believe a lie over the truth. May your hearts break for somebody who sees this unborn child as nothing more than a lump of flesh because they're willing to believe a lie over the truth. May your hearts break for somebody who does not acknowledge that every human being is created in the image of God. May your hearts break for that because they're lying to themselves. Does it make you surprised? Satan is the father of and so what is he doing in our culture and even sneaks into the church dressed like a lamb when he's a wolf in sheep's clothing sneaking into the church sneaking into the flock and dividing us over the things that are not important
And he appeared to Cephas, Peter, and then the twelve, and then appeared to five hundred brothers at one time, most of whom were still alive, though some had fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, last of all, to one untimely born, he appeared to me. Paul's Damascus Road experience is more like you and I. No longer here, my friends, in the way he was. His new and glorified resurrected body is not here. It's at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And he is going to come again to judge the living and the dead. Jesus is not here the way he was. He is now there. And when he comes again, it will be too late for this world. But right now, you and I have the gift of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to end with that personal testimony. I don't share this often. I do it about once a year or so. About 20 years ago, I did not want to live anymore. And I was on my way to commit suicide. I loved Jesus. I had no doubt about where I was going. I was on the highway, driving to a place that was two-thirds of the way there. It was about a 300-foot cliff, and I was ready to go. In my pocket was a picture of my family. Some music came on. And for whatever reason, that music... At first, very spiritual music, it was Christian radio. I was like, this is great. I'm coming home, Lord. Here I come. I was at peace about the decision, by the way. Talk about how Satan works. And I firmly believe that the Holy Spirit had me pull that picture out and look at my family. My youngest, Caleb, was a newborn. And I start running through my head. He'll never know his father. My daughter, who was adopted, whose earthly birth father commits suicide, all of a sudden the Holy Spirit starts going, are you going to do that to her again? And you got to realize, I've been driving for two and a half hours, committed to this decision. Every time I thought about not doing it, I would say, I'm coming home, Lord. I'm not going to fail at this. I'm already a failure as a husband, as, as a father, as a, as a church person. And I was ready to go home. Through the tears, I look up and I see a hospital sign. And I said, okay, you got one chance. And I pull into the hospital parking lot and I go into the, the waiting room and I sit there and I sit there and I sit there. I first go to the front desk and you know what it's like to go to a waiting room, an emergency room. And I'm sitting there bawling my eyes out and I'm holding a picture and a little itty bitty one comes up to me at like four years old and touches my knee and goes, do you have a boo-boo? Boo-boo. And I had a boo-boo in my heart. No boo-boo anyplace else. And I said, again, Lord, I'm failing at this too. I had a good plan. I'm coming home. And I stood up and I was making a beeline towards the exit door. And a security guard stepped in front of me and said, Sir, we'll see you right now. I don't know about you, but in my life, the music that came on, the, the fact that that picture was in my pocket, that I was willing to look at it, God had his hand and would not let go. That's my kooky story. You have your kooky stories. But the truth is, we have a God that loves us no matter how kooky we are. No matter how pain we find ourselves in, what pain we find ourselves in, He loves us so much that He doesn't expect blind faith. He's going to put the right people in your path. He's going to put the right program on the radio. He's going to put the right pastor at the pulpit. He's going to put the right book in your hand. And this one is always the right one, by the way. Why? Because our God loves us. 
he appeared to those 500, not for an insignificant reason, not for a no reason. He appeared to 500 people all at once to confirm the truth that Jesus, fully God and fully man, died on that cross, was buried in the tomb, and rose from the dead for your sins and mine. My friends, may your faith be on the foundation of truth, not emotion. Let's pray. Father, we give you glory and praise that you do love us, that you are all-loving and all-knowing and all-powerful, and that you step into our lives and bring to us what we need to have faith in you. Lord, it is our prayer that you step into the lives of our neighbors, our family, our friends, and may we be used by you if it's your desire to help them find you. Lord, to you be glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we sing, he lives. Hymn number 368. I picked this song for both good and bad reasons. There's a line in this song that is so theologically shallow, and yet this is one of the great hymns of the faith. Please don't think that just the new music that's out there in Christianity has shallow theology. So do some of the beautiful hymns. The real question is, does it move somebody closer to Jesus Christ? This song says, how do I know he lives? He lives within my heart. Well, I know that's true. The Holy Spirit confirms it. But a Buddhist is going to tell me that. Someone who believes in Confucianism is going to tell me that. But they cannot tell me that their Savior lives. They're not in history. There's a dead body somewhere rotting in the ground from the Buddha. There's a dead body rotting somewhere in the ground of Muhammad. But there is a resurrected body in heaven. Jesus Christ. He lives. Let's stand and sing together verses 1, 2, and 3. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know Rejoice, rejoice. 
Oh, Father, we ask that you would receive these, your gifts to us, and use them, that this dying world would find Christ. Yes, Lord. Like those 500 witnesses, may we also be a witness of what Christ has done in our lives, that this world would find you. Mm -hmm. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We continue in our worship during our congregational prayer. Please be seated. to die on our behalf. That we could be brought from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. You hate sin. You hate to look upon sin. You can't look upon sin. But through Christ, you can look upon us and say this. Father, everything that we have, everything that we have, we owe to you. Mm -hmm. We owe undying love and devotion. Our hearts, our minds, our souls, And Father, too far too often, we do it for ourselves. We live for our desires. And not for ours. We live for our dreams. And not for what we have. We are so appreciative of our blessings. A place in you. Our lives are in this world. The things of this world. And I should be all in you. And all in you. Because we're going to be there. Teach us to worship you, thy body, and soul, to come before you and bend with you. Come before you and instruct you. And instruct you. Your desire is to bless us and things. And those things that we consider good, and those things we consider bad. Help us discern you in all things. Help us to know how you are changing us for the better. 
changing this to be more like the purpose. Thank you that you have given us a ministry of prayer. Father, there are those who spend their lives in prayer for you, lifting their brothers and sisters. Heavenly. Sometimes you can go weeks and years and decades without response. Your answer is no. Her kids in the heavens. How we ask you to be my own. How we ask you to to bless me. By itself. Issue of prayer. So we just go up to you. We have prayed in your own to you. We ask you to touch her now. And let it together at home to her glory. And we ask you to bless Ella. She goes in for a cat on the street. We ask your wisdom to still.
Father, we lift your name up and come before you. Lord, I ask you to revive me, revive us. For there are areas in our heart that have become Father. Areas that have become that respond to you Father today is not peace. We ask that you will be done. We ask for the this church, this individuals, we come to you because you can do it. As we look around, the world seems to be winning. But we know it's not. We know that in you, you have we have victory. We have salvation. And we have a heavenly game. <coughs> Father, we ask your blessings on those that serve our community. First responders. We know it's right. Those who give their time to serve you. They may not know that they are serving you. They may think that they are doing a good deed. They may wish to be recognized for their own. as they bless your people and all people in the world and in the world. Father, we lift my choice for life in the sweet tree. Father, let us break your hearts as it breaks on us. The way that Regress in our culture and something that would be shameful and hidden. To something that is celebrated. And as you bring it on, you will take that. Father, give us prayers that see the people in your world. We come to you, turn your back on the foot, and do not do it by yourself. Father, I ask you to bless the ministries of this church, the elders. Those 
chosen to teach children to teach. Those that we have to kiss have to save us. Those who love you desire to serve you. Who will pay? Sister Pam, as she is struggling, she is hemorrhaging, we just ask that you would stop and heal her. Now that she's facing surgery, Lord, we just ask that you would hold her close and pour out your hand and just take care of the needs of her physical body. And we thank you that you would heal her spirit and that she knows you. And we look forward to when she and Matthew and Daniel can be here together. We can worship together. In Jesus' name. All glory, honor, and praise belongs to you, Almighty God. Thank you, Father, that even though we're sinful people, you've not forgotten us, you've not left us alone. As we reach out to you, confessing our sins, we know that that you're faithful and that you will revive us. Breathe your breath into us, Holy Spirit, that you may be honored and glorified. Christ lifted up. Dearly Father, I thank you, Lord, for another day of life. The most precious gift that we could ever get. Mm. Dearly Father, I ask you to continue to be with my mom, Lord. She's laying in the hospital bed. Lord of God, we don't always understand what you're doing, but you do, Lord. I ask you, Lord, oh God, just to help the doctors and the nurses, Lord, oh God, to do what they need to do on a daily basis, Lord, oh God, so that you can do your work in you and her, both physically, emotionally, and spiritually, day by day, Lord, oh God. Dear me, Father, I just ask you to be with my family. And I, Lord, as we're going through our own emotions, our emotions all in our own way, Lord of God, none of us are going through them the same. We're all going through them differently. I ask you to strengthen each, each and every one of us, Lord of God. Heavenly Father, help us, Lord, to continue to look at you each and every day. Keep our eyes on you, Lord of God. Heavenly Father, I ask you, Lord of God, just to bring us through this day by day, day by day. As we allow you to do your work in my mom, in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Lord, we 
thank and praise you for Renee's presence with us this morning. We thank you for answering prayers. Hallelujah. What a mighty God you say. Father, I just come to you now and I bring Fred to 